Richard Entrup. I'm with KPMG, the U.S. member firm, and I work in an innovation team that focuses on emerging technologies like generative AI. I must say that last discussion was amazingly insightful and impactful, and there's one book, I had the honor of, of having dinner with X last night, there's one book I suggest you all read, it's called The Invisible Women, that really speaks to all of the uh, lack of, of diversity and inclusion within our physical world, and this discussion is happening throughout this conference around how what's happening in the physical world is manifesting in this, this new AI world. And as someone mentioned, there's a great opportunity for us to really get it right this time. So anyway, I'm not speaking about DEI and AI. My topic initially was going to be focused on the history of AI. I was going to go back to folks like Turing and Minsky and talk about where, where we all came from and how we got here. But on the flight down, I was catching up with all of my AI news and in the last two weeks alone, there's been more significant announcements and news updates in the last, I don't know, a few months, probably more than a year of any other technology sector. So I thought I'd open up with a little bit of a, what's going on in AI and Gen AI specifically? Again, two, two weeks. So our friend Elon dropped a new AI chatbot called Grok, many of you may have heard of. He's, he's actually training Grok on Twitter, now X feeds, so what can go wrong there? Um, it's a bit snarky and sarcastic. It's unfiltered. Um, it's a bit of fun right now, but I suspect this is a foundation that Elon's testing to see where this can go. Um, I had became aware that he had purchased a large number of NVIDIA A100s a few months back, and this was this is the outcome of that of that investment. So, the other big announcement, as we've discussed here at the conference, is the Biden executive order, which has I think a, a, a large number of great. And, and very necessary uh, stipulations in there to protect this technology. There are some folks on the fence regarding this, this thing as it relates to open source AI, also startups and their ability to maintain the cost and impact and staff needed to remain compliant. I'm a former CIO and I've managed things like HIPAA and GDPR and PII and PCI and probably 100 compliance things that go into managing IT and systems and organizations. It's very expensive. So there's, there's, a, there's a couple of folks that have different opinions on, on that. Google made some big announcements around advertising. They're, they're now using more AI-driven technology for how we advertise. Things like SEO and SCM and other things are being enhanced. Microsoft made uh, an interesting relationship with a company called InWorld that was accelerated by Disney a few years back. InWorld provides personality traits to avatars. So now they're going to be integrating personalities in the characters in Xbox games, which is another, I think, big AI win. And of course, the OpenAI announcements, uh, OpenAI had their first dev day last Monday, week today. And there were a slew of really just amazing advancements from just V4 just came out. Now we're on V4 Turbo. The context window, that is the box that you type in your prompts, went to 128K, which is the equivalent of, I think, 300-page book. 64%, um, sorry, 64 tokens of that 128K in, in various tests produce 100% accuracy on the outputs, which is also a very interesting statistic. Uh, new modalities, there's a new agent store. This is the Apple store for OpenAI. I'm not sure everyone's like reading the tea leaves here and what's happening, but let's keep in mind Salesforce, um, Shopify, and of course Apple produce tens of billions of dollars on these platforms. So what, what Sam has announced is basically we're all going to be able to build agents that leverage the, the OpenAI ChatGPT platform for all kinds of utilities from personal assistance to analyzing large swaths of videos on YouTube and summarizing them. So we can all be publishers and developers of content and make revenue from this with very little source code and, and um, computer programming experience. So this is going to be significant. The one thing I'll add on this is that, let's face it, I think Apple has touted uh, $1.1 trillion in revenue on the Apple Store. $120 billion of that is actually soft goods, things like apps that others build. Apple takes a very handsome investment off that. Sam, I think, announced they'll take 50%. So from a revenue opportunity, it's going to be very interesting. Um, and also, a big one. So we all know that ChatGPT 4 went up until September of 23. That means everything searched in the, in the context window, in the prompt, 
would not be aware of current events. Now it's, it's been pushed up to April, April of this year of 23, which is significant also. So uh, a few other quick ones. Jeffrey Katzenberg announced that from, from my media friends, and I came from media three times, Disney, Viacom, and Time Water, Katzenberg made a statement that AI will cut the speed and cost of all production by 90%. Um, which is interesting to, to make that statement in light of all of the SAG, uh, SAC activity happening right now, which, as Kerry mentioned earlier, is coming to some closure, thank God, for many of my media friends. Uh, two ex-Apple folks uh, found product people from Apple launched a new company called Humane. Uh, they're going to have a new product called the AI Pin, which you basically wear. There's no screen. It's fully native AI. Based OpenAI, I believe they're using. It's it's got a, a relationship with T-Mobile, so it'll be connected for cellular. There's no screen. There's no keyboard. It's all voice activated. Uh, basically, you could project on your palm or on other surfaces. So we'll see where that goes. But th I think that's going to be a significant uh, advancement. Google doubled down on Anthropic, as we know. They initially had put in 500 million. They just committed to another two, a total of two billion dollars in Anthropic. Uh, and then I guess another tidbit I found out yesterday I was reading, uh, Open, OpenAI is offering Google researchers ten million, five to $10 million compensation packages right now, which is, I, th I thought was an interesting statistic to note. And then last but not least, all of this is happening less than one year when GPT-35 was announced. This thing is not even a year old, November 30th of last year. So we've come 12 months. And here we are, I mean, every conference I attend, and I speak quite often, every client can't get enough uh, knowledge on what do we do with this technology. So hopefully I'll share some of that today as well. So the big tech leaders are all on the, um, on the same side when it comes to the top line opportunities around generative AI. They all feel very confident that this is a significant technology that will change everything as we know it in work and life. On the challenges and risks side, um, some of these thought leaders, um, the spectrum is wide. Some feel that it does represent this dystopian existential threat to mankind. Um, others feel that perhaps all of this compliance and regulatory things that are happening may be a result of, uh, it, may, it may provide a competitive advantage to the large organizations, getting back to my point about compliance being costly, that might stifle innovation because the startups won't be able to play as often. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a double edge right now, how they feel about it, but um, Look, I, I think I'm a promise guy. I'm not a peril guy. So I, I'm, I'm on the promise side. I, I've been around a long time in technology and have seen many come. This thing is at some very unique peak of, um, of unrealistic expectations. I forget what the hype cycle says. But the next step is the trough of disillusionment in the, on the Gartner hype cycle. So and, and every technology goes through this. This may, it may go a lot faster to come back out and, and be, so we'll see where that goes, but I thought this was interesting context on all these leaders. So the K KPI perspective, KPMG, sorry, we conduct many uh, surveys. We provide a lot of insights on various topics. We surveyed 300 executives from VP and above on this topic of generative AI. Um, and the consistency on the opportunity was, as we expected, more than half more than 70% all felt confident that this was a large, significant, impactful technology opportunity. They were confident it would impact their workforces in a very significant way, and that they would be implementing these technologies within the next two years. And uh, more than half also believe that their business would gain competitive advantage. All of them had their IT departments using this technology for I don't know how many IT folks are in the audience here. So IT operations and writing source code and software development uh, has been significantly impacted by this technology already. So you can write code quicker, faster, more accurately. On the challenges side, as expected, over 90% felt strongly, as everyone I think does, that this does represent some significant gains, uh, uh, security concerns, and less than half thought that they were not or at the initial stages of actually assessing what that meant. The other concerns, as we've talked about, there's a talent issue here on AI resources because the Googles and the Anthropics and all of these startups are, are just chopping up this talent, just like Wall Street did back in the day when they started dabbling with AI in the 90s in, in algorithms. Uh, there's a cost, I think, of investment. IT organizations are having to shift costs on, from keeping the trains running on IT systems, but also supporting innovation efforts that this supports. And then last but not least, the business case. 
So I'm a big believer in Clay Christensen's define the business out, define the business problems, define the jobs to be done first. Don't lead with the technology. So I think blockchain went through this cycle. AI is now, what are we doing? There's this dynamic that boards and CEOs are asking senior IT leaders, what are we doing with this technology? And, and a lot of them that I speak to daily um, are, are kind of scurrying now to f figure this out. And my, my answer is basically identify some real business problems in the departments like HR or fi finance and what have you and go after those in a very small way and make some wins and start, start playing. <clears throat> Then last but not least, cybersecurity. I think one of my colleagues from KPMG will sp be speaking more detail around what we're doing around this. Cybersecurity is a core competency for KPMG. Uh, we've been at it for a long time, and then we now integrated a responsible AI framework within our cyber services as well. So, so we did the industry, we did the clients. This is a VC perspective. So prior to joining KPMG, I was an advisor and sometimes investor to companies in various sectors like Web3 and blockchain, um, also one Gen AI company. The trajectory of investments and number of unicorns, um, the valuations are a bit off the charts. This is just amazing what's happening. The interesting standout here, and I put it in red, 78% of these Gen AI companies that exist haven't even raised money yet. It was 90% last year, by the way. Um, and by the way, these, these are just sample logos. There's no, you know, I have no, no uh, pro or con statements, but these are, this is where the activity is happening. Uh, I think someone mentioned infliction earlier, which is interesting. So, so VC investment is definitely a signal to watch for any emerging technology. I think it's very telling. This is not letting up. Again, just recently with <clears throat> Google's investment with Anthropic, and there's more coming. There's also been, I think, 13 significant exits already. Uh, ML, M, um, ML, is it, um, I forget, Mosaic, sorry, ML to Databricks, and a few others that have represented around, I think, $13 billion in exits already. And again, this is a year old. Uh, important to note, here's my history, evolution slide. I was gonna open up with that before I went into what's happening in the last two weeks, but, <clears throat> excuse me, this is not new technology. Uh, it's been around quite some time. Every so often it rears its head. Some chess master gets beat social media, some bad documentaries on Netflix around how social media are, are affecting our children using this technology. I don't know about you all, but TikTok can be somewhat addictive, so it's, the algorithms are very powerful and, and affect our behavior for sure. Um, so I, I guess the, the takeaway here, and I speak to a lot of clients trying to educate them on where this came from, it's not new. Actually, generative AI is not new, neither are large language models. Something happened last year that was an inflection point that blew all this up, and I'll speak about that. And generative AI sits in this one category of all of this text-to-speech, text-to-video, text-to-now 3D images, um, and it's been consumerized. That's what happened in the last 12 months. Before this, you know, generative AI was only available to data scientists in very large companies, in very expensive institutions like MIT that could write actual query and source code. Now it's been consumerized, so anyone that can type into a Google box and have access to cloud-based GPUs and large data sets that were only ever available to a select few. So what happened? So in my opinion, and I'm deep down this rabbit hole since probably um, April of 22, I'm also an art geek, so I play with all these tools and create images. You can check my Twitter on it. I post a lot on that. This product Lenza dropped, and Lenza was a company called Prism Labs, I believe, dropped this tool called Magic Avatars. It was downloaded 20 million times in a very short period of time, and it let you upload photos of yourself, and then you'd get back a package of AI images like these here, which I'm not too crazy about. I actually used the bottom, the bottom left one for my social media. And I think this was part of that consumerization and awareness. There's another package, there's another app called Reface, which lets you put anyone's face on any image, any movie scene, any photo, and it's really uncanny. You can't tell, you can distinguish it from reality. The other thing that happened at the same time, roughly last summer, these were beta, and now they've become full products, is Midjourney, you've probably heard of, creating all of these Im fun images, albeit having to access it through something called Discord, which is not the friendliest platform. It's more for gamers. Dolly 2, which is OpenAI's image creator. Stability AI, which uh, harnessed the open source model for, video, for image creation called Stable Diffusion, which is a unicorn also. And then last but not least, Runway, which lets you take images or actually text to image, text to video, 
So you can type in what you want to see in a, in, a, in a short video and it creates it for you. Or image to video, albeit 16 seconds. So this tech, the, all of these were, I think, were also part of that consumerization. Obviously, November 22, ChatGPT dropped and was downloaded, I think, the fastest in history compared to all these other mobile apps. It hit 100 million users, I think, by February of 23, less than six months later. And then everything else that occurred, on, as I mentioned, on the, on, the, on the venture capital side, the, the Microsoft infusion of cash into OpenAI was significant, and there's, that's not ending. Google with put out Bard. There were some issues there. Anthropic produced Claude. Although my dear friend Toby kind of talked a little down on, on Claude there earlier, but I haven't witnessed that from them. But um, look, this is early. I think someone mentioned, Ken perhaps mentioned, this is very early. This is a year, I mean, it's, not, it's a year old to the world. It's, it's become culture. AI is not new to the world. It's been around for 80 years. But um, this is the beginning. And, and just like the internet, I hate to date myself, but just like the internet came out, no one knew what it was. The information superhighway, right? Organizations blocked it, just like every organization blocked ChatGPT when it came out, which was an interesting dynamic to me. Um, it's what came after that, right? The internet basically is connectivity. It's all of these apps that came out with Web2 and social media and Netflix and watching television and all of these utilities that came out. And that's what I think the real magic's gonna happen with this technology. Um, it's what's coming next. So from a use case perspective, uh, there are many. We have very significant frameworks. We support financial services. KPMG supports every sector. But these are just some examples by sector on some use cases that I mentioned earlier about identifying real business problems to solve. These are some sample use cases that Gen AI could impact. The bottom left for me is significant, again, coming from media and being closest to this sector of generative AI. This is impacting them in a great way. As you all know, there was a strike with the media, with SAG and what have you. And, and as Kerry mentioned earlier, people are very worried about their brand and their image and their voice and everything being <clears throat> captured and then leveraged and sold and them not getting a piece of it. So it's a, it's a, it's a serious concern. Um, product design and development. I personally helped close a recent consumer products company that are making, can't say what they make, but they make fashion and they're using tools like Midjourney and Stability to create new products. So I think also someone mentioned on a previous panel, if Gen AI does one thing in my humble opinion, it does a few things, but one of the main things it does is it totally eradicates writer's block. So whether you're a script writer or an artist or a creator trying to start something or writing a story, using these tools just, gets, just crushes that and gets you right into getting creative and getting the creative juices flowing. So that's the upside, and that's what happened. There's been a lot of talk here around the, the, the risks and threats. As I said, I'm a, I'm a promise guy, not a peril guy, but uh, there are serious concerns. As I mentioned, I've been a CIO and managed IT organizations for, for decades. Um, data privacy, things like healthcare, right? The healthcare institutions, we have HIPAA, we have GDPR for our friends in the EU. Protecting data has been paramount for organizations and for boards for many years and it's regulatory and compliance. But there are some nuances in generative AI that folks need to be aware of. I think someone at the breakfast this morning from Deutsche Bank mentioned the prompts themselves are potential risks to compromising intellectual property. So you need to monitor that. The outcomes of the prompts generating these things are also potential leaks for IP and what have you. The deep fake situation is going to get real scary real fast. It's still, you, see, you can still tell if you see an image or you see a video. You can still tell it's not real, but there, it's happening very fast. I think within a year, we will not be able to distinguish photos or video or audio from, from reality. And, and that, that, I think, represents some serious issues. So all of these mechanisms that have been discussed today, like um, watermarking or time stamping the outputs, so we all know it's, it's AI generated might be one example. And then the other one is protecting the creatives. I came from the art world twice. I was at Christie's and MoMA as a technology person, not in the art world. But I have lots of friends who are artists in this space. And their content, they're on both sides of the fence. Some feel infringed that they're, they're creative. I mean, an art to artists is their life. It's their children. I mean, it's just very personal. And they feel like they've been infringed upon from a copyright perspective. And then there are others that you all probably have seen out there. One, Rafik Anadol from Turkey, which is just crushing it right now, creating, he's now in the permanent installation at MoMA. That's leveraging the technology to enhance what it is that he does. So 
Um, while it augments all roles, I think all of these issues are valid. Um, I think 80% of the existing data controls that exist in organizations will suffice, but there are some nuances with this Gen AI thing that I think need to be seriously looked at, and organizations like ourselves are helping many companies in this, this responsible AI framework. So I can't, do I have a clock here? Oh, I'm still doing good. So, um, so KPMG, you know, I, I, again, I speak to clients. We've been at this for quite some time. We've challenged ourselves as an organization. We've built chat GPTs for all of our functions. We're an advisory business. We have a tax business, and we have an advisory business, which provides technology and other services, consulting services to clients. So we're using these tools internally in our, in our own way. So we're drinking our own Kool-Aid, not just selling services on this stuff, but we, we're doing it. We've established a very significant relationship with Microsoft, you all may have heard of, which is a $2 billion commitment over the next few years. So we're working very closely with them in Seattle. KPMG has had a very significant AI platform called Ignite that we've been using for years, long before any, this, this, this explosion happened. And I'd um, be happy to share more of that, about that offline. We have some of the Ignite folks here today, as a matter of fact. And then last but not least, we maintain a very strong generative AI community because no one can go at this alone. The Googles and the Microsofts have all partnered with startups for a reason. So I think building your ecosystem and bringing in startups and staying in touch with VCs in order to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening, because it's happening really fast. And VCs keep up because that's what they do, and large organizations need to do the same. We've got awards, we've got patents, so we're, we're actually an established leader in this space. We've also produced, just put out through one of our groups where I work in, we put out a company called Cranium, which is an AI cyber product that actually helps organizations identify risks within their AI frameworks. So how to get started, again, my, my slides usually I'm speaking to boards and CIOs and helping them get started with this technology. Um, the punchline on this slide is really start small. This is not some large transformation project, ERP systems, or a, a large consolidation of something. And this is something that is still new. There are still lots of kinks to work out on the, the models themselves. Not, a, not many organizations, if any, are starting to build their own large language models. All of them are using the Anthropics and the open AIs as foundational models. And then through mechanisms like fine tuning and vector databases and all of this tech jargon, with chunking and parsing and indexing, they're basically ingest, they're using the foundational model of open AI or Anthropic, and then they're overlaying that with their own data in some cases, and then they're fine tuning it to ensure that it's safe. And I think Ken mentioned at breakfast this morning, sorry to call you out twice, Ken, but great point, great point. The fact is, many organizations' data isn't even their data. It's their clients or their customers or their patients. So they just can't blindly train models with it. There's a lot of um, not so sexy things that have to happen in the back end, back end with getting all this to work. So the, there's a consumer aspect and there's an enterprise corporate aspect. The consumer side, it's a mobile app. You download it, you punch in some prompts, you get these images, you get video, you get music, you can do anything. It's fun, it's exciting. On the enterprise side, organizations have great risks with data, and they have for decades. So um, the approach is different. So there's still a lot to work out with these foundational models, how they were trained. One of the things about the, I think, executive order from the White House, someone summed it up in an analogy. They said, so you have to disclose, um, you have to disclose the outputs, when not, or you have to disclose like the architecture, but not the actual recipe, meaning you don't have to disclose how you trained, what you trained on. And that's still, I think, a serious issue to, for, before we can get some idea on, on what are in these black boxes that we call large language models. So long story short on this one, again, identify small, valuable use cases, try to identify real problems to solve, um, and start small, because th there's still a lot to work out here. So this is a quick snapshot of a, of a practical application. I'm not gonna show the demo. I'm not sure if the AV guys, I'll probably drive them nuts if I did, but this is an avatar that we built as a prototype called Genie. And uh, it's based on uh, some interesting technology that I, I can't go into detail with, but this is not a video of an animation or a CGI where you type in text, press enter, and then the CGI speaks. This is an interactive front end to chat GBT that we've done some fine tuning with. You can have a conversation with her about, about anything. 
Um, and we, we're prototyping this at a couple of clients right now. The top little guy there is something called Buddy. He's a, he was built for a healthcare system to help kids um, just deal with, if they're going in for treatments or diagnostics or, or chemo, whatever it is, Buddy can help them before they show up at the clinic with, with what is, what's going to happen. And it's, it's a very interactive and I think tech for good if there is one. That's a great use case there. So this is something else we're doing to challenge ourselves to really leverage this technology. And there was another panel that happened, I think, with, with Kerry and was it uh, Dan from Vermilio on the whole blockchain of, of rights and what have you, I think it's very, very interesting to me on this front. But um, anyway, so that's, that's a little bit about us challenging ourselves.